from Sunset Beach, Hawaii, weighing 267 pounds, the Magnificent Morocco. Why is it they call him Magnificent? The man who lifts condominiums off his chest. Anything that's explosive, anything that's exciting, Prince of Darkness, Master of Destruction, perpetrator of violence. Get ready! I'm going to burn this place down! Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of Don Morocco's Magnificent Podcast. My name's James, you can follow us on Twitter at Don Morocco Pod and on YouTube, Don Morocco's Magnificent Podcast for the video version of this podcast and loads of clips and stuff. But now, let's introduce you to the Beach Bum, the Magnificent One, the original rock and according to my sources, the third richest wrestler in wrestling history at $52 million in the bank. It's Don Morocco, how are you doing? Boy, where, let me see your sources. <laughs> you well, you apparently. Hello, according, huh, yeah. <laughs> according to celebworth.net, you're worth fifty-two million dollars, and you earn a million every year. Boy, that's wonderful. I, you know, I'm a rich man. I don't have any money. <laughs> no money, but I'm a rich man. I, I live in Hawaii. My Everybody's healthy. Uh, things are going around. My health sucks. But aside from that, my family's doing great. Well, that fifty-two million that'll, that'll, that'll buy a heck of a lot of health care. Boy, I tell you, I got great health care from the. I was a longshoreman, twenty-five years. Is that for life? Sorry. Is that for life? Uh, health care after being a longshoreman. Oh yeah, yeah. And after I passed my wife. Hmm. My wife said because she got a good retirement after she gets to 70, 75% of uh, my retirement after I'm gone. And with the continuing uh, health care and uh, dental health care. You're a longshoreman in the United States. You're, you're doing all right. Hmm. I mean, you, you know. I, I will never understand, understand the American health system because here we just get it all free. And it's just taking out your taxes at the end of the year. Yeah, but... yeah. Like Canada. Mm. The Commonwealth, the, the, yeah. They're, well, you know, America, big profits, big money, mm. Far, big pharma, big pharmaceuticals. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> Break out your wallet and start paying taxes. <laughs> I'll tell you what, then we'll move on for the American healthcare system because I've I've nothing really more to add. I don't think all I know is it's expensive, and I've seen Breaking Bad several times, and he seems to get quite big bills at the end of it. That's why he has to turn to meth uh, production. But um, the first thing I'll mention is uh, we started the last podcast with uh, a mention of Don Canodal, who just passed away, and a couple of days ago, someone else has just passed away in the wrestling fraternity. Uh, but at least this time, he was ninety years old which might as well be like a thousand in wrestling years. Uh, Tony Marino. Uh, what do you remember of Tony Marino? Because oh. I believe he was, uh, he wrestled in Hawaii. He was in Hawaii and I was in Florida. I was in, I remember I was in Florida with him and uh, he was a good guy. He was, you know, he was a, uh, an old bodybuilder that, uh, that, that started working under the Sheik, I believe, or at least in the D- Detroit area. And then, and then travel around the, United States and probably Japan and a few other places internationally. But uh, one thing, he was a good guy. I was always, you know, always, always up front, always, always fun to talk with, always fun to be with. But I'll never forget him. He was one of the Fort Hesterly, Fort Hesterly Armory on a, on a Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday night, the, the, the normal, the normal wrestling for Tuesday night Tampa wrestling at Fort Hesterly. Oh, maybe between four to 6,000 people over at 6,000 was a sellout and four to six and, you know, Dusty Rhodes, Jack Briscoe, Eddie Graham, Mike Graham, Steve Kern, that whole, the uh, uh, Malenko, that whole group that they took the pair. But I, I, I remember about Tony and one of the, one of the funniest things I, I ever saw in the business, he was in a tag. I, I don't remember who his partner was. But I remember Jerry Briscoe was on the other team. And Jerry Briscoe's boom, boom, coming back. And the Briscoes are left-handed anyway. So Briscoe threw that big looping left hand. And Tony always said, don't hit the, watch the hair, watch the hair. <laughs> Jerry threw that big looping left hand. And evidently it caught Tony just well. Woo! 
<laughs> off his head came the <laughs> off his head came the toupee, and it was a good size one. And just took off, took off across. It looked like Rocky the Flying Squirrel. And just took <laughs> off across, took off across to the the wrestlers and the you know, everybody stand up in the balcony there watching the wrestlers, the fans, everybody in the building just broke down and you know he's chasing to get his chasing to get his piece back. And the, they never got the, the match. I think. And another match or two before they could finally get the crowd back down from you know the, that hair flying off. But that's just that's one thing I'll, I'll always remember. I'll always remember Tony Marino, one of the that and Mike York with the bear. But that that you know that that's one of the one of the highlights of the, my my career. Was was he a bad guy at the time? Because that would have been just the best thing to do in the arena every single night is just lose your hair. Yeah, he he was a heel. He was, but he, you know, he wasn't. Uh, he was like Angelo Poffo and some of those guys, you know, don't, 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 you know, don't touch, don't touch. They didn't want to lose their hair. They wanted to, they were very self-conscious over their, uh, over their hair. They, you know, because they got the, I got the piece on, you know, watch. And in those days we worked like that, you know, you, you had something, you, you had a sore eye or something like that. I could stay away from it. You know, I wouldn't have to, or I, or I could work on it and, and you know, either, you wouldn't know it either. You know, that's, that's how work used to be. Right, so give me a few other, like, wrestling wig wearers. So I know Bruno Sammartino wore that thatch bird's nest on his head for a while. Um, oh, man. Stan Lane uh, from the Midnight Express, he tried out for a little bit, and then and he ended up getting sewn into his head or something and then got it taken out. Oh, Cal- really? I didn't know. <laughs> uh, I believe Cowboy Bob Ellis. Am I going crazy there? I think he wore a wig at one point. I never I never came across Bob Ellis. I, I wrote... I asked somebody if, if what kind of worker, you know, what kind of guy he was. I said he was a hell of a guy and, and a big draw. Because I remember him from the magazines and stuff. And Wahoo McDaniels, you didn't have a you know, Wahoo, Wahoo and a couple. They used to, put, used to shoe polish, put the use the shoe polish on their you know, the, on their head, not to. Uh, and if you didn't know, sometimes you'd get a headlock on. You'd come out here. <laughs> <laughs> They're all covered in shoe polish. But uh, Wahoo, uh, a couple of Dick McKenzie, he was one. He was one crazy about his hair as well. Are there any uh, any other confirmed wig wearers you can reveal? Oh, God, not off a hand. I, 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 nothing comes to mind at the moment. Okay, then. Um, Batman. Tony Marino was Batman with two Ts. Did you ever experience the Batman? No, that was up in Detroit. That's when he was up in Detroit, I think. Detroit and Canada, Ontario and Hamilton, those areas, I believe. I'm not sure. Pittsburgh, I believe he uh, had his big, okay. biggest success in uh, that. And as well, uh, it's the thing that people always throw in Bruno Sammartino's face, where he always said, I hate gimmick wrestlers, I hate gimmick wrestlers. He was tag team champions with Batman. Yeah, he was one of Bruno's boys out of Pittsburgh with... Uh, Dominic and uh, Mike Cicluna and a few of those other guys. And, and Bruno had that uh, little territory going over in the Pittsburgh area. Did you ever wrestle in the Pittsburgh area for San Martino? Not for San Martino, no. Yeah, that was that was uh, that was gone. They were he was in a, he was in a war with the McMahons uh, during the when I first came in, and he was. Uh, they denied him. Um, they denied him that that he wanted that, you know, just that Western Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania, into uh, into into West Virginia, and um, there was a bunch of towns, all oh, within 150 miles of Pittsburgh that had good, you know, coal mining towns, that had you know good uh, good populations, good buildings to run in, you know, and he could make a. If you had a crew of uh, 12, 16 guys, you could make them a decent living, a weekly, you know, weekly money for the blow off in Pittsburgh, I suppose. Mm-hmm. George Steele, uh, Tom Meyer started there, I think. Or he started in Detroit, but he, he, he worked, uh, did a lot, went to Pittsburgh a lot for Bruno. And uh, the last question for Tony Marino. I mean, when I first said it, I thought Tony Marino from Saturday Night Fever, but apparently that's not his name anyway. But, um, do you know who played Robin to Tony Marino's Batman? No, no one seems to know. 
I don't know. I didn't know there was one. I, yeah. Bruno, I guess. <laughs> If only, if only, but we're going to move on there and we're going to go straight to Bob Backland. He is the subject today. And uh, the first question I generally ask you is the first time you met Bob. Oh, in Florida, when he came down with the, with the, with the belt, um, we didn't really meet. We just had, uh, I think we were in Miami at a show and we we're in different locker rooms. So we just, uh, we just, you know, met in the ring and that was it. The next time was in town, the, the the last tag on Tampa, the infamous night there where I split his eye and, you know, God, there goes all my, you know, there goes my chances out the window to New York. But, you know, evidently didn't, it didn't, didn't amount to anything to him. So uh, I turned out, uh, it turned out good. And I didn't know, I, I, so I hadn't really met him, you know, except for, you know, and, and even the times that I was working with him, I, I didn't spend a lot of time with him. Right, so you won't know too much about like maybe his amateur accomplishments and early days getting into the business then. Well, the bios that I read about the you know the the wrestling uh, amateur wrestling title one year and the next year he didn't return and then uh, he was always he was he was a condition uh, uh, a condition a holic he was always in, he did the, the hour of step tests and hour of wheels and you know just simultaneously always in condition. I heard, I don't know if it's true, that uh, the the bed in his in his home, he just had the uh, six inch uh, six inch foam pad that uh, he and his wife uh, slept on. No bed, just the foam. And he was very was frugal. He was very, you know, he was he traveled by himself, kept to himself. You know, it was it was the end of an era. Different era. I like how he was so frugal. He probably still hasn't got a bed. Well, I heard after I spoke to him, I, I, I never really spoke to him until after I got out of the business. But uh, last time I spoke to him, he was running a loan company, running doing a doing a doing a loan service. And previously, before that, when I ran into him, he was uh, uh, delivering oil in the uh, in the Northeast there, pumping and carrying the hoses and doing everything himself, doing doing all the work, uh, doing all the labor, and reportedly. By himself, doing all the labor himself, hmm. pumping the oil in the people's homes and doing all, you know, I, 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 I am, I'm sure, I'm sure that's a lot of hard work, you know, carrying those hoses and hooking everything up and cold weather, hot weather, whatever it is. I'm sure that was a lot of work. So I, I heard that those are two of his uh, enterprises after professional wrestling. <laughs> Well, I know he always liked to work hard, and I read quite a lot of his biography, uh, autobiography, in preparation for this. And one of the things I learned from him is uh, in his first territory, which is Tri-States, which is, I think that predates Mid-South, but it's basically Mid-South. Uh, he was one of the wrestlers who got in before the show started with the fans, wrestled the fans, and basically, you know, made them realize that wrestling was real, uh, or that was the intention. Were you ever put, you know, you've got some amateur credentials yourself. Were you ever put in that position to ever wrestle fans to sort of, you know, let them know what's up? No, no, never, never. Uh, oh, we kept apart. I was, yeah, I was never in that. Uh, never, never held up to that that type of standard. Most of the a lot of the guys came and they had their own their own area, own places. Uh, you know, Bob, Bob. I'm sure Bob just enjoyed it. That's why he would show up and and work out with uh, people in the ring. You know, guys in the ring, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, any territories uh, that you worked where that was still a, a staple, a feature, uh, whether you'd invite fans in before the show? No, did Japan. Oh. Only Japan, only in those days after that. Uh, and then when I came back later, much, much later in the 2000s, uh, with the Hall of Fames and stuff, they were in the garden working on matches before the, when the ring was up, hmm. before the matches. And then I was, whoa, I was... I was pretty pretty shocked. Not shocked, but you know, it's, boy, have things changed. <laughs> Do you uh, back in my day? <laughs> Do you uh, remember hearing any stories about Bob? I mean, you said you don't really didn't really hang out with him too much, but do you remember any stories about Bob, where very mild mannered, but when he was tested or challenged, he would really you know kick some serious ass, whether whether it was in the bars or wherever it may be. Oh, I have one story that he could uh, he could op open his throat 
And then, then and he would take a beer, he could take a beer, stick his stick a finger, drink another extra hole in, and, and he could just empty the beer as fast as as fast as it would go, you know, the, the chugging. He would he would uh, he could out chug, you know, as fast as the, the 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 liquid or beer or whatever would go down. He you know, he would uh, do it. But he was like you know, he wasn't a guy. Maybe I don't know. Maybe one time he was stuck with Skolin or something like that. That, that you know that something like that would happen. Skolin used to tell. Skolin told that story. But uh, he, he wasn't out. He kept to himself uh, almost exclusively. Well, I'll take it. I know this next answer then, but uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, did you ever arm wrestling? Because apparently he was good at that as well. No, no. I strictly worked. <laughs> we strictly worked together. <laughs> hours and hours and hours, but no arm wrestling or, you know, uh, feats. Well, feats of strength were involved. He picked me up in a short arm scissors and did some other stuff that, you know, was, was pretty, uh, pretty impressive. But as far as uh, challenging one another, no. Uh, where was your first match with Bob? Was it in Florida? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and he was champion already. All right. So what year are we talking? Like around 1980, sort of around that time? 79, 80, yeah, 79. So Eddie Graham then, what relationship did he have with Vince McMahon Sr. at this time? Because obviously it must have been pretty good uh, to just have Bob Backlund come in, defend the title uh, sort of like how Andre the Giant would be farmed out. All the promoters in those days were pretty well, pretty well connected. Like I spoke earlier when the Ultimate Warrior was was pretty much before he his his time came in, and guys, you know, Shawn Michaels and the Click and all these other people um, started arranging things that uh, there was. Uh, who we're talking about now? Bob. Um, Oh, Eddie Graham and Vince McMahon Senior. Yeah, Eddie Graham. That uh, all all the promoters were uh, were were you know in coats, as it were. They, they didn't. Uh, they weren't. They weren't. They weren't anxious to see the boys really get ahead. Other than you know what they would you know they were. It's just true. They weren't. They weren't anxious to see you know what was going to happen. Bill Watts somehow broke out of uh, Leroy McGurk and took over Oklahoma and Louisiana there, and a lot of people call it stealing. But I whether. True or not, I don't know. I wasn't there, but a lot of guys they weren't they weren't happy to see. Uh, Vince Senior protected Mike LaBelle in Los Angeles. Used to send him talent there uh, from SD to Java Rook to I remember uh, uh, Ron Ron Hall or so he sent there as, as an ex executioner. And Vince would pay the balance of their you guarantee him five six hundred a week, whatever it was, and what they're making in LA which was really nothing, you know, in LA at the time, Vince would supplement it with his own, uh, with his own payoff. That's, that's, you know, a lot of guys in LA, he took care of. So the promoters worked, worked hand in hand. Vince, uh, Eddie Graham. I, I, um, I don't know who was running the garden back then, who was running New York, whether it was uh, Vince senior or the, the, uh, an org organization that they had, you know, Zacco and uh, and and Senior and uh, maybe Jesse McMahon, uh, Vince Vince Senior's father, but uh, Eddie Graham and Jerry Graham were two of the uh, absolute top cards, and Jerry Graham was a savant of sorts for uh, wrestling and stuff. And then you know the booze and everything else drove him drove him, drove him out of his mind. And Eddie was drinking pretty good at the time, but it said that he would write down. All the stuff that, that, that Jerry would, was laying out on on business and stuff. So, yeah, I, I'm sure you know they they spoke and they were and Jim Barnett was in there too. So everybody, you know, everybody was in the they're all in a business relationship apart from the the wrestlers. Uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a bit more about Dr. Jerry Graham. Do you have you got any personal memories of him? Because I think his heyday was in the '50s, wasn't it? And I believe that Vince McMahon. That was his, Jerry Graham was his favorite wrestler of all time. Yeah. Um, I think that's Vince McMahon Jr. Yeah, Jr., excuse me. Junior, Junior, Vince, um, uh, Jerry Graham and Freddie Blassie. He just, because of Blassie, yeah, he was, uh, and, you know, and I heard he was, he was in Los Angeles with superstar Billy Graham when, when, when Billy was 
God, this would have to be like 71. Uh, before I even went, before I went to the WW, AWA, so it'd have to be early, early 71, maybe early 72. So Billy, they, um, Vince Sr. would would uh, would take care of, uh, would put uh, Jerry on the road with somebody. He was with Murdoch and Rhodes and Amarillo. And then I guess he was with uh, Superstar in L.A. And, you know, he'd, he'd keep all, all right. Then he'd boom, he'd go, he'd go on a binge and go crazy, you know, for, and, and all of a sudden. But he was very, very clever, very, you know, beside the point, in between the lines kind of guy. And uh, in those days, he's kind of burned out. But, you know, he's still Jerry Graham. <clears throat> Do you remember Luke Graham? Yeah. Well, he, he was where he was the third he was like a third wheel. He, he was just, he was not just, he was one of the boys. He was one of us. He was one of me. He was, a, he was around, he was, he was a wrestler and uh, uh, was able to carry the, you know, I don't know how he got probably with Eddie. He became uh, a brother in, in uh, I don't know if it was in Florida or New York or where it was, but uh, I'm sure it had to be with Eddie. He became a Graham and then he, he kept the, uh, Kept the crazy Luke Graham uh, as the rest of his career, I suppose. And then uh, I think, yeah, and then Billy Graham was the fourth and final of the Grahams, wasn't he? But we'll hopefully talk about Billy Graham uh, in more depth. In like the, he so deserves his own show on this. So I'll have to like come up with a ton of questions. Yeah. I'll do him another time. So I'll go back to Bob Backlund and take us to the last tangle in Tampa. Now this wasn't the first match you had with Bob, was it? Uh, I don't know if it was in Miami. Your first Miami at a at yeah. a big big show they had out there I think at the water park or something like that and uh, but we never spoke before at, at before that match we were in uh, we were secluded locker rooms separate locker rooms and they they carried just carried the finish back I don't even I don't even recall what the finish was and then um, and then the, the Tampa the same thing but uh, same thing we we never communicated but it was going around somewhere. And, I remember. I just remember catching with the elbow and going, "Oh, shit. <laughs> Man, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this sucks." And you know, no, I said, "You know, you always have, you know, it's, uh, dreams of going to New York and working with the champion." I thought, "Oh man, you know, clumsy, clumsy me." And you know, I just blew it, but yeah, it didn't. It didn't matter. And it was. It was. Uh, it was a small, small cut. So. Wasn't a big yeah. deal. It would have been good for the match, surely. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't hurt. Yeah. Uh, do you uh, do you remember how often Florida would run these super shows? Because I always, uh, when I when I look back on these things, I always hear like the big Mid South <laughs> super shows and uh, other places. But I didn't realize Florida did these big shows as well. How often would they run, and where would they run? Um, depends on. The, I, I you know I, I imagine they would book. Uh, the Bayfront Arena was the big show there in St. Petersburg, and I, I imagine you know naturally they'd have uh, they'd have to book that in advance because of rock concerts or whatever else they happened to go going through there. So you know they would have to all over long they they have to uh, schedule that in advance. They would uh, you know adjust the programming and the uh, a world champion whoever the world champion was going to be and you know that that, that timing. To set up to bring in that night at the Bayfront. So whenever uh, I'd say four to six weeks in, out of Tampa, I and mean, Tampa was the hub for the wrestling. Uh, Miami always had big buildings, and then they would go, you know, in the convention center and, and other places. They always had uh, big sites there, but they would go to a they would go to a special uh, 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 football field or Orange Bowl or stadium or something if they had something that they wanted. They wanted, you know, so, so a big blow off. They thought they could do some, you know, extraordinary business with. Yeah. Do you remember where they uh, mostly ran for the Thanksgiving and Christmas shows? Oh, Did they have. Well, uh, Jack, I remember Jack going to Jacksonville one Thanksgiving. So uh, yeah, they had shows. Uh, I'm sure they had. You know, they were pretty much special, spectaculars. And, and stuff there, but well, Jacksonville was your normal Thursday town. So there, and then probably, probably the holidays, Christmas, and alike, 
back in those days, they would uh, they would go black. They would go dark on those days. Hmm. Uh, do you remember um, Eddie Graham? Uh, how much input would he have on your match? Uh, you know, would he suggest stuff or would he just leave you to it? Because I've heard various uh, uh, versions of events where he's very, very specific about what he wants. Yeah, he was brilliant. He was. He organized that. Uh, he organized that territory to fit his uh, his whole philosophy of wrestling. He got. He had a bunch of uh, ex ex wrestlers hookers. He said, Here, Matsuda, Jack Briscoe. You know, up and down the line, guys in there that that protected the business on the mat and could hook you and stuff like that. And Danny Hodge, and and, and that aspect to to get 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 into the business. And then he had the, you know, and his territory at times, or it was a strong point of his territory were, were wrestling wrestlers, you know, wrestling wrestlers, uh, Jack Briscoe himself, you know, different guys, Johnny Valentine, guys like that that were solid. Uh, and, but he still would have, you know, Bobby Shane and some other guy, you know, guys that were flamboyant and guys that, that you know, pushed, pushed the envelope in entertainment. In those days, you know, you, you look, you, you look back, they weren't the same as, as the stuff going on there. So it was easy, easier for him to keep a tight fist on everything else, you know. Hmm. And I've got to ask this. Do you remember what the payoff was for uh, the last tangle? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't want to give the number, that's fine. I'll, I'll move on. Uh, yeah, yeah, I wasn't, uh, I was less than pleased. <laughs> <laughs> so you're very happy to get the recommendations to go to the WWF then? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I took off. And uh, yeah, he was happy. I was, yeah, more than uh, more than happy to be moving on. I, you know, I reached the end of my ropes of, at, at times being away from Hawaii. You know, that, that's why I would never, you know, I was never, you know, a good candidate for world NWA world champion. It wasn't until I got to wasn't until I got to uh, uh, to New York, the WWF, that I would, uh, you know, that I, I settled down, stayed there for more than a year. Well, well you know, Santa Cruz, Santa, uh, San Francisco territory was a different story too, because I was I was living right in the right in the ocean as well, so mm. I was I was a lot more. Uh, uh, it was a lot easier to get along with Santa Cruz. Yeah. How come you never went to like the Gulf, um, the Florida? Uh, how would you? I don't even. I'm not from there. I've never been there. How would you? You know, the Gulf states, Mexico. I'm gonna have to cut this entire thing out because it sounds so stupid. I'll. Uh, there was a territory on the coast of Florida, sort of northern Florida. Um, I think like Michael Hayes. Pensacola, Alabama. Pensacola. Thank. Uh, yes. Pensacola, Pensacola Florida, Alabama. Yeah. 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 Uh, that was the Fullers. One of the Fuller boys, I think, uh, uh, the older one, Ronald, and Robert ended, ended up going up there. Uh, Buddy Fuller, I was with Buddy Fuller's part of you know area as well, and he was he's an old uh, old timer from that area. So he was partners with Eddie, and he had, he had a lot to do uh, in the background. But he was an old hand in down south there, and he had they had Pensacola and. Uh, uh, certain towns in, in Alabama and up there in the, the Florida Panhandle that, that did, did could be. And it was a, in those days, I, I guess you could uh, you could go up there and you know come away with uh, six hundred thousand dollars a week, which you know back then was was pretty decent. That guys like uh, Joel Duke and um, you know other other you know other guys that, that headlined up there. That's where uh, oh. Terry Belay started. Hmm. Up, up, you know, well, that's before he got his first push. Hulk Hogan up there in the Pensacola, Alabama, because they didn't uh, Dusty didn't want him in in Florida because he take a look at him. <laughs> you know, the guy was uh, you know you could you could tell it wouldn't wouldn't be long before he would be you know he would be taking over the show. Yeah, do you Dusty think Dusty was a shark? <clears throat> Uh, with Bob Backlund, uh, he's got loads of fans, loads of people who said he was absolutely great, and then the, the, his detractors, of course, there seem to be one side or the other with Bob, opinion-wise. One of them is Larry Zabisco, who said, on the negative cat, uh, camp, who said that as champion, Bob nearly bankrupted the WWF. 
is he going crazy with speculation there or did houses really go down with Bob as champion? Do you know? Um, when I was there, all the houses were full, you know, from up and down, up and down the, uh, Boston and, and there, did you, 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 you look at those, the New York cards, they were fantastic. You had a, you had a, a world tag team champion, you know, strong bows, Fuji Tanaka, Valiance, on and on, just you know, it had a, it had a good you know, uh, Gurian Martel, Gurian and and, and uh, Haystacks, you know, you had, a, you had a bunch of guys. You had another another title there. Then you you had uh, maybe George Steele or you know other guys. You had you had a great card. You had great cards. Or wasn't and and Bob, and you got to look. It was you know as pre uh, 1985, 19 you know WW. F just before it became E, it was pre those days where you need where it was you could have a champion that was wholesome and, and um and, and clean and you know and, and uh and you know drank his milk and said all the things that Hulk you know was said his took his vitamins and said his prayers and and, and, a, and an amateur background and a guy like that and you could have a guy and he was you know he was he was more than adequate in the ring. But you could have a guy like that, um, maybe color, colorless or, or very, you know, very vanilla as far as that. But your heel had to supply. Your heel and his manager had to supply, you know, the fireworks, the color, the incentive to go and, and take, you know. And maybe sometimes the crowds were mixed and they didn't, didn't care for, you know, weren't happy with that type of baby face. But that's what they always got. And, and it turned out, you know, and it, it was – it was a, it was always a uh, formula for success. So driving, uh, you know, Larry was a Larry was a Bruno Bruno guy, you know, hundred percent Bruno. So um, maybe there's some validity to, validity to what he said, or that he didn't. I don't know. If, I don't know if he had a, another run after after uh, his run with Bruno. He had another run back through there, or they didn't want to use him, or what exactly the case was, but. Uh, you know, I don't think uh, I don't think Vince Senior. Vince, you know, look at the markets you have: Madison Square Garden, Boston Garden, Philadelphia Spectrum, Washington D.C. Cap Center, um, Baltimore seated about twelve, fourteen thousand. You know, Pittsburgh twelve, fourteen thousand. And you know, you're you're you know, you're in a population mecca. You know, you're throwing, you're closing your eyes and you're throwing darts and you're hitting a bullseye every time. You know. And if not, you're, you end up with your Scranton, you know, you get a fifteen twenty thousand dollar house, or you know, you're, you're so it's not, uh, you know, and you paid accordingly. You know, you weren't, you didn't have guys on guarantees, you didn't have guys on contracts. Then the TV was very, very minimal at those times. They had probably one truck, and, and a, you know, one truck, an announcer, and your 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 crew that ran it. So it wasn't, uh, you know, you're not talking about WWE days, you know. With, you know, warriors and Shawn Michaels and guys coming in pyrotechnics and everything else. It was, you know, a lot, very simply. So I, I can't see the overhead being that, uh, that great where, you know, the Vince was either, either, either the Vince's were applying for welfare. <laughs> uh, you mentioned managers before and managers had to carry a lot of the burden. You've got to give us some Arnold Scarland or Scoland stories, excuse me. The manager Stones, of champions. Yeah, he was with Marine. Huh? The manager of champions. <clears throat> he was a great guy. His son just passed away last year. I, it was good. I just, I just hooked up with, again with him, and he married anyway. And and uh, two or three months after I, I hooked up with him, he passed suddenly. He was younger than I am. But anyway, um, are they going the trip? We go on trips to. You know, on the we go on the road, but in the old days, you know, the before pre Vince Jr., we'd go, we'd go on a loop. We'd go from uh, Utica, New York, to Rochester, or to Utica, Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, and come back or, or work our way or start at Buffalo and work our way back. He usually stayed in one one hotel. There was an ex wrestler, I can't remember his name. He had a, a, a hotel in um, Utica, New York. So that all the guys, you know, the majority of the guys would stay there. There was a gym. 
down the street when we were guys to work out. There was a there was a, uh, a supermarket and stuff, and they'd get there and they they start playing cards. And, and Skolin would you know, and they'd sit there all day to the matches, and they go to the matches, and they continue playing cards, and then they'd start you know, and Skolin they'd start. He had usually they had Lou on one of those trips to Albano, so they start drinking, and then you know, and Skolin have his hat on, and he's driving his van. And they're going. They go down the road, and there, it was like you know, it was like the student, like the Keystone Cops. Man, they went. Me and Angelo Mosca were standing outside the market one time, oh midnight. You know, just, just something. Everything was closed, and they're walking around the market like the Joe Namath thing, where they're eating off the shelves, eating, making their own sandwiches as they're walking along, and they they, 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 they made a habit of doing stuff like that. Not schooling. Schooling would spend. Schooling would sit in the car and. Altamore and and, uh, and Lou and George Steele, they're uh, they're doing that. They're doing that kind of stuff. Hmm. I heard up in Maine. I wasn't there, but in Maine there was one of these all night uh, all night supermarkets, and Lou was walking around eating chicken and throwing the bones. The guy came up, Mister Abana, please, you can eat whatever you want, do whatever you want, just don't throw the bones and stuff. <laughs> we, get, we get rats. <laughs> that was. Those are the old tales, those old guys. Do you remember? Um, do you remember what Arnold did after? Because uh, he worked backstage for years. Uh, what did he do after he was a manager? Like, was he just an agent, or or what? What, what did he work? He was as? an agent. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't try after 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 after. I'm sure you know the traveling got it. He would run White Plains. He had a White Plains was his. Um, White Plains, New York, and. Uh, I think he had part of Poughkeepsie. He, he kept, uh, you know, he, he kept, he, Monsoon, uh, a couple other guys, um, I think Phil Zacco, still had a part of, part, you know, parts of, uh, parts of other towns that Vince, because uh, they were, they were old, old cronies of Vince Sr. And they, they had, uh, they presented no challenge to Junior and no opposition, you know. And he, I guess he finally bought, bought all of them out. Yet monsoon, I think monsoon had some, some, some sway in, in the Western Pennsylvania and and New Jersey. I'm going to give you a, a quote now from uh, Bob Backen's book. Where are my glasses? Here they are, because I actually need them. I'm getting old. Oh, right here we go. From Bob Backen's book, he says, "I was very excited to have Don in the WWF territory. Morocco was a handsome, cocky, athletic guy with all the skills in the world, and the persona he played just came naturally to him." The WWF was also noted for big guys, and Don had shoulders as big as anyone in the business, so he really looked the part. Vince Senior liked Morocco immediately, and after getting the seal of approval from Eddie Graham down in Florida, that Don was as reliable and could be trust uh, excuse me and could be trusted not to mistakes, Vince felt comfortable putting him into the Federation's second biggest spot as the Intercontinental Champion. Was it? Was it just that simple? Eddie Graham says, this guy's the guy, and then all of a sudden you're the second most important person in the WWF when you went in. Hard to say. I, I, I just, I read that earlier too. I'm, you know, I'm not really aware. I, I, I uh, gee, you know, there was, there, Pedro was there. Patterson was there. I, you know, to say I was the second, uh, I was number two on the, on the line. I, I was, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure it's probably, the, you know, one of the top heels. But then there was Slaughter, and uh, Bill Eady came in, and of course the the, uh, the Iron Sheik ended up coming in, eventually for Hogan. So you know, I, I had a good run there. But <laughs> as far as uh, you know, what's that? That was Bob's perception, and I'm sure he had a lot of input into into a lot of that, and and uh, an aspect or a portion of the, uh, the business I wasn't uh, I was I wasn't privy to. You know, with Eddie Graham, and you know, I was on good terms with Eddie. Eddie, um, I was on, on, honest, honest with him. He was honest. With, you know, I, I spoke with him, and we we uh, discussed things when I was leaving Florida, and and uh, he given me a lot of sound advice. And um, he was a good man. I, you know, it, it, the demons. I, I the demons come with this business, and they come with every business. So the alcohol, or the pills, or you know, whatever it happens to be. I don't think wrestlers have a as have a monopoly on uh, on messed up lives, but you know they certainly have a, their lifestyle 
and their their uh, proximity to, you know, drugs or booze or women or whatever it it it, it is that uh, can mess up a family. They cer- certainly have access to quite a bit of it. But I mean, it, 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 it's a stellar reputation you must have had to go straight in there. But I, I, I bring up the quote because you did face Backland quite early on your WWF full time tenure, I should say, because you made a few appearances earlier in the uh, in the year in 1980. So I think you started full time in 1980 in May, uh, and almost immediately uh, you wrestled Backland a few times, and then you wrestle the Intercontinental Championship away from Pedro Morales in the Philly Spectrum. Do you remember that match in particular? Because uh, as Bob writes in his book, the fans just went absolutely bananas for that one in particular. I think it came around. I, I was I was one of the first heels, or maybe the first heel, to come in the opposite way. Because my first match in Madison Square Garden, where everybody else would come and do their, their six weeks or eight, eight weeks of, of uh, TV tapings, their first match would be against the champion, Backlund, Bruno, Pedro, whoever where it was. Or my first match in the garden was with Rick Martel. And I, I didn't even get a clean win. I, I he got he got counted out. He would, you know, hesitant at doing a job in the garden. So he I dropped him on the thing and he went to the floor and he got counted out. I had plenty of heat, it didn't matter. Then came Pedro and I got the intercontinental title after that. And uh, but uh, not in the garden. I had rematches in the garden, but in, in Philadelphia, I wrestling with Pedro was a blast. He was solid, you know. It, it was easy, you know. Work hard, you know. 15, 20 minutes of fire and brimstone, and, and you know what? And you go home, you know. It was uh, it was akin to wrestling, you know, being in the ring with Hulk or or one of those guys or, or Bob, you know, or Bob was maybe a slower, longer drawn out. But it was akin to, you know, being with any Ricky Steamboat, all the guys I had, you know, Jimmy Snooker, all the guys I had, uh, had every relationship I had, um, had moments with, had, had, you know, had angles with programs with. You know, so um, with Bobby, you know, there was naturally there, he was a champion. And then I had, had the Intercontinental title. And... Um, it had been, you know, it had been brewing for a while, and as, uh, and it just turned into those sixteen-minute matches, all, all out of the, all in and all around the territory. Did um, because I hear the stories when a WWF champion's about to go in, and Vince, Vince McMahon Senior will uh, supposedly tell them the day they're winning the belt and the day they're losing the belt. Uh, did Vince McMahon Senior give you any specific guarantees about either money? or who you'd be working with and for how long time-wise uh, before you went up there, or were you just you just went up there and what happened happened? Well, I just showed up with my bag and my boots. <laughs> that was it. You know, it was... Uh, there was only a few guys back in those days that uh, that were making those kind of deals. Guys that were coming out, uh, Dusty, the Funks, uh, Mary Jared Lawler... Uh, Guys, you know, guys that, that had some stroke in the office, that were that were working offices and, and were booking and Pat Patterson and guys at that, at that time. Uh, on the rest, you know, on, on the, and the other like maybe Slaughter, Valentine, you know, the heels around my era, you know, they, they came on. They were just, you know, we're coming in and just trying to work, trying to get ourselves over, you know, trying to prove for a while. Well, they knew. I mean, you knew you're going. You were working towards a title match anyway, as as, as you're coming in as the new heel, as the, because it, it would run, you know, it, it was it was like a cyclic thing, you know, in New York. They'd come in three, two or three, depending on your success, two or three shots of the champion, boom, into a little smaller angle, you know, six seven months later you're out of the territory, but you know things were were changing then, so I went out for a couple months but came right back in. Because they moved on to a, a WWE type format where they were Vince was taking over uh, taking over the country, and he wanted to keep the talent that he had, the talent that there was already uh, already over on his TV. Uh, before I carry on with the Bob Backlund uh, thing, I've got to ask you your first manager, the Grand Wizard Ernie Roth. How was he? Give us some Ernie Roth stories. There's not a lot of Ernie Ross stories, really. He kept a, he was a low profile. He was, uh, 
he was secretary for senior down in uh, in Fort Lauderdale. He did a lot of, um, well, I guess the clerical work and stuff and, in a way. And he had been, the, the wizard had been, uh, it, it, yeah, he lived quite a exciting, quite a checkered life. He was one of those guys with a, uh, a radio evangelist. You know, can you feel the power of the Lord? You know, put your hand on the radio and feel the spirit coming to you. And he used to do, all, he used to do, he used to hustle that before he got into wrestling. So as a pitch man for the Sheik, you know, it was a, it wasn't much of a transition. You know, he would, he would do that. The, uh, hour, two hour, three hour evangel evangel evangelical, you know, uh, uh, ratings, stealings for money and stuff like that. So that's how, that's how he graduated as a, as a manager. He was, cause he was a frail little man, maybe 110, 115 pounds. And he'd come and he'd march all over the ring and do all this stuff. And when, when you're, when you're in one of his charges, all his interviews, everything else was, was centered right at you. He, he took, he took no, uh, took no, no, no shine off you. Everything was for his guy, whether it be me or Valentine or whoever, he, whoever had to be his charge at the time. His, his, uh, his focus was hundred percent on me or Greg, whoever it happened to be. It's weird how many wrestlers seem to go into preaching, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Especially now. Now it's, uh, now it's becoming vogue. Yeah. So it's a cottage in industry of just wrestling evangelists. There's so many out there. Well, it's a big, it's easy crossover, I suppose. You know? <laughs> we'll leave that there then. Um, with the original yeah. Bob Backlund uh, matches, you end up losing via DQ, count out, double DQ, no decisive finishes. That's that's par for the course, isn't it, for the building up of a, a big a big match. But yeah. How, how, yeah, we're going... We're, we're going for that hour, you know. So, so how would you go about preparing a Bob Backlund match? Or I know it's old school and you don't really talk and anything like that. But how do you prepare yourself, or what do you expect from a Bob Backlund match that you wouldn't with somebody else? Well, you 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 slow down, you know. For portions, you you're you know you're in you're in holes longer. You're in. Uh, you just, you can't you can't go 100 miles an hour for an hour you know you just you're you're longer in holes you're taking time uh, selling holes selling uh, selling moves you know stomp you know just stretching it out as you have to do with an hour if you, other times you know you go through you if, if the spot arises it you comes you go right through it you go into it you don't sometimes you don't have to take it back down but in that, that case you would have to you know, you, you build up to points and down and up and down. You, you know, you come to peaks and valleys where you had to do it. And you can't uh, you can't look for that, that peak right away. You know, you have to, you know, that peak comes a couple of times. Well, Roy Shires had a formula out of uh, out of San Francisco, how to run a match, how to how to diagram a match. It that the very first comeback when the, the the baby face comes back. The biggest comeback of the night will be his very first one. That was, that was Roy's philosophy being that the heel goes in, get, you know, get some fast heat and you come back like a maniac at your first one. And then you settle down in the match. You have uh, a, a lot of number of high spots and then you, you know, you get to eat up again and, and go into the finish. So that's a, that was Roy's, you know, that was Roy's philosophy. And, you know, obviously it doesn't really hold through. Or if you're a champion and you've been there month after month, week after week, uh, you know, on TV and stuff, and you have that low profile, you have that grinding style, it doesn't make sense to go, you know, come out right away, you know, uh, doing uh, kip-ups and cartwheels, you know, and, and acting like the superfly. You know you're going to, you know, you're going an hour. So you come in and, you you know, you settle down and you just uh, – Try and get the uh, try and be serious, and try to get the, the crowd to be serious with you. Did you ever sell everything close, close quarters and everything? Solid movement, solid, uh, solid, solid arm lock, solid, solid headlock. You know, solid work. Did uh, did you ever gas out 
or were you just experienced enough that you knew how to pay, pace yourself? No, I mean, yeah, we, we was used to, you know, I was a good, I was doing hours, hour step tests and working out in those, in those days. I was, I was young and young and fun. <laughs> I won't go to the rest yeah. of it. Yeah. <laughs> were you ever banned? And I'm saying this for a reason. Were you ever banned from using a certain term to describe Bob in your interviews? Howdy doody. Uh, he didn't. Uh, oh, uh, I used to once, and then somebody mentioned that he didn't. You know, he wasn't. He, he didn't like it. He wasn't. Uh, you know, well, he would prefer it, 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 what, if it wasn't. You know, that's all it took. Sure, you don't like it. I'm not gonna. You know, stick my finger up your nose. And, you know what? What for? To you know, rile the. So you know, he, I I used it one time early on. Uh, you know, oh guy. You know, we do. Dozens and dozens of interviews. So, you know, something you you just you just run dry after a while. So you know, just uh, boom, howdy doody, pops in your head. You go with it. And oh, somebody mentions he doesn't like it. Okay, so you just scratch it off the scratch it off the board. That, that's about it. You know, he didn't care to. Uh, but the one time was his only. That was about his only bitch. I think you know the the, the howdy doody thing. So what would you uh, what would you uh, go after him on your interviews? What would be the thing like the cutting line? Oh, uh, I think I would mostly gear the interview or the everything to how how great I was, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to uh, you know uh, well I, you know I my philosophy is, in the business is supposed to make make my opponent as great as possible because when I'm going to beat him or if I'm beating him or beating somebody I'm beating somebody that's you know way up there somebody you know. Somebody worthy, worthy beating. Somebody worthy, you know, worthy, worthy, you know, that that you can get a defeat from, and you're really putting a notch in your gun. So I, I would go, you know, most of. Uh, I don't think Dural, Pedro, maybe. Oh, you like the beautiful people, all your friends. Same stuff, blah blah. I'm gonna coming after you, and you know, after well, well, Pedro and I had more of a heated relationship, but Pedro is a more fiery, fiery character, and Pedro and I weren't doing ours. You know, we're, we're doing, you know, 20, 30 minutes and, you know, and, and uh, or whatever and, and, and going through. But Bob and I, so I would, with that, that philosophy, I would more, I would more talk about myself and how good I was and how pretty I was and how handsome and well, you know, how, you know, like a Ric Flair and limousines and jet planes and, you know, the, uh, what is it, Magic Mountain and all that other stuff. You know, so yeah. You end up putting yourself over more than, uh, you know, more than, than somebody, because they know he's champion. You don't have to. So you just, you know, you just build him. You, you know, he's built up and you're not going to be able to really tear him down because he's still champion when the interview's over. So you just, uh, you know, you just talk about, I would, you know, I think mostly I was just talking about myself, how, you know, how great I was, how, you know, this, and that, all the attributes and everything I, I contained. Go straight to the Madison Square Garden matches with Bob. And was it two or three? Did you have a series of two or three? Three. Three. Uh, which, so was it a, a regular match, the first one? The Texas Death regular match? match something second. happened. And the second one we had, uh, we, we, we fought, uh, we was a, was a pull apart. We both lost our tempers and. And fought, you know, and they gave, you know, just just fought under the floor and back in the ring and everything else. And they had to send the wrestlers out and pull us apart. Oh, maybe the second, maybe that was the first one. The second one was the hour through, and the third one was the uh, two-hour time of it, or something like that. You know, it was, yeah, that, that would probably be the first one to pull apart. The second one, the hour through, and, or maybe the second. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember now. Uh, the Texas Death Match. T- talk us through how we, how do you do a Texas Death Match? Because isn't it sort of half a last man standing match? I don't think I've ever seen one, so you'll have to explain it to me. Oh, well, every territory had their own rules. I think. Um, oh God, maybe it's the most falls in an hour or something like that. I'll be I, an I'm Iron sure. Man, I think. Yeah, I'm not. I, I'm not sure the. 
uh, the stipulations of the Texas death match at, at the garden was at the time, you know, I think we ended up in a cage somewhere too, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, Boston, I believe you ended up Boston, in a cage afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause we went, we worked, uh, you know, I a lot with them all over the place. So, you know, it's, it's hard to put in order the different, uh, different things we did, you know, to, to bring back the next week. Uh, when was the time when the short arm scissors didn't go quite according to plan because you were leaning on them a bit too much? Uh, somewhere in the middle, you know. After after we were, you know, started working an arm, and he'd uh, he'd do it real good. He'd start to go, and then he wouldn't be able to get, you know, he'd start to pick me up, and then 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 he finally he'd get me all the way up and put me on a put me on the turnbuckle and slap me or something. I'd take a bump. Uh, I might have, I might have uh, prompted you for the wrong story then. Uh, when was the time you sat on his balls? Oh, we were working. Yeah, we were working. A, probably short arm scissors too, or or it was just a was it you know just a was just a thing. I knew, that's where the point where I knew he trusted me. Yeah, you know, <laughs> had a lot of trust. Had a lot of trust. I, I rolled up. Ah, can you lay here for a second? Take it out. I'm like, sure. What are you? Yeah, it landed on one of my balls, and it hurts. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, I'll tell you what, right? So in 1981, in fact, just before I ask that, cage matches versus regular matches, are like gimmick matches like that easier to do because you've got more to work with or not so much? Oh, well, you got the momentum going in, you know. You, you built for it, so the... You know, people are already there. You know, they're already buying. You're not. You don't have to be selling that 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 much. They're up. they're already going. And you you have to keep a higher pace. You know, you, you got to rev your engine you know, a little little harder because you know you have to deliver. Uh, you know, more seriously than than you would. You know, a, a normal match that you that you're building to an hour or building up up more. Uh, was the last match you had with Bob the uh, two matches in Hawaii, and then that was it, or did you ever face him again? Uh, probably, yeah, uh, last in Hawaii. Yeah, um, I believe, so I was reading in Bob's book again, and he says no matter what Peter Maivir did, uh, because he was uh, him and uh, Leah Maivir were running the territory at the time, I believe that he didn't have solid foundation for television, and they were on sometimes, off sometimes, and that would affect the house. Uh, is that true? What had happened there is they lost their, they lost their weekly building. Like, like Tampa had Fort Hesterly Armory every Tuesday, and um, Dallas the Sportatorium, and Portland the, the the converted bowling alley. They had their weekly spot. They had their normal all the, all the territories had their normal spot where they would where they would run, run their weekly shows. You know the chant. And that before they could get to a, uh, maybe a world champion coming into town, or something else. So when they lost, when they lost the Civic Auditorium, they used to have uh, rock concerts, roller derby during the summer, and wrestling year round. And it was one of those smoky, steamy buildings, with the cigar smoke and the clouds and everything else. But and it seated, well, probably three to five thousand people. And the lots often it wasn't full, but you know. It was a good, solid wrestling crowd. They had the best buttered popcorn in the world. But uh, yeah, they they had once they lost that base. Pretty much all the, all the all the territories are the same because you know as, as progress comes and your your inner city, your downtowns and stuff change, you lose your fundamental building. Uh, ECW that that place they put up outside of Philadelphia, where the, the, you know the, the fans would go and go wild there. When, when you lose that base, you know, uh, it's, you know, fans are, are funny creatures too. The creatures of habit and they have, you know, this is our place. This is, you know, this place belongs to us. This is where I see wrestling. Civic Auditorium, this is where I met. First met uh, courtesy of Kea and Ripper Collins, Johnny Brand, these kind of guys. This is where I first, you know, and where I, where I followed it, where I partook. And when they lose that constant, that base, it, it seems like, uh, it, it it falls apart. It, it were you know at least unless you're able to replace it with a with a you know suitable or equal equal type uh, 
equal type setting, then, then it's hard to maintain. I'm really interested in when Bob Backlund faced the Iron Sheik and the Iron Sheik beats Backlund and it's the very, very, very famous finish where Sheiky's got Backlund in the camel clutch. Backlund refuses to tap out or submit or I quit or whatever it was back then because there was no tap out. And then uh, Arnie Skolan <coughs> throws in the towel. In your opinion, is that a... Does he is he dominated by that finish or is that protecting him? Because I can't quite work out myself. That was just before he um, he left, and I wasn't. Uh, I'd heard stories that he didn't want to, or it had to be a wrestler that, that was going to beat him. It had to be somebody with a with a you know. These are just things that I've read. I don't I don't know as facts or anything else. Um, that Arnold's throwing the, the the towel and Bob. Uh, declining it, you know, is, is is a is a good out. It is you know, I I would have done it probably another way, but uh, you know, it, it was it was a good. And it didn't it didn't matter because the momentum flowed right into Hulk, and when Hulk showed up, bang, it didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Nothing mattered anymore. Uh, you weren't in the territory at the time, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, apparently. Vince McMahon Jr. wanted to turn Bob Backlund heel in 1984 after losing uh, to the Iron Sheik. Uh, did you ever hear anything about that? Apparently, Vince wanted him to dye his hair. Just what I've read. I I, I know nothing. Know nothing as as a fact. Just uh, other hearsay and things that, that went down. Uh, when uh, and obviously you weren't in the WWF, you retired by this point. When Bob Backlund came back and became the crazy Mister Backlund character around '94, did you realise that he had that in him? Like, because had he ever, you know, said, "Watch this tonight, guys," you know, doing a doing an interview, and then that came out, and then he dialed it back again and became the uh, nice Mister Bob Backlund again. Did you did you realise that was in him at all? Well, no, because he'd never done that before. But you know, he was a he was a talented individual. So seeing him go, you know. So see him go nuts. Well, was it, was it, he was a professional wrestler. Hell, you know if he, you know you're not able to go go insane, you're in the wrong business. You know, so he, it was it was a you know change, but whether you bought it or not, it, it depends on you know you're following the way you fell above. Uh, and I'll ask this one to finish it off before the Mister Fuji story of the week. Where does Bob rank uh, as far as your rivals, as for your talent, uh, enjoyment in wrestling him? And as a champion face of a company, to me, right up there. Uh, you know, I, I've always said Dory Funk Jr. one of my favorite uh, wrestlers in his style. Um, you know, he was a world champion. They had, they all had their own style. Jack Briscoe had that that left arm. You know, that that left arm coming out you know, the way the Briscoes do. Uh, to the they're left-handed, and then uh, Terry Funk was different. Dory Junior. Harley had that where he cocked that left up and threw that punch. I the success I, I would suppose would, would be uh, in the box office, where uh, you know where where they you know and their the judgment of them you know how they uh, how they performed. I you know I spent a lot of time with Bob. I, I spent you know many matches and you know lots of time in the ring with him. So you know he would be right up there with my, uh, you know, with my my champ, my list of champions and everything else. He'd have to be, you know. He he made me a, you know, he made me a a, a, a solid, uh, solid name, a solid individual in WWF and, and around the world after that. So, you know, uh, different champions. Bruno was different style champion. Pedro is forgotten as his, uh, almost forgotten as his type of champ at time as champion. But uh, that's a long story too, but that, that goes on why he wasn't uh, longer was he, uh, coming from Australia. But um, gee, Jack, you know, you have to be the guys I worked with the most. And, and Hulk, you know, I worked with Hulk. Hulk was world champion when I worked with him. And then I had the, you know, I had the misfortune of coming out of WrestleMania in Madison Square Garden, the first match after, after mess, after WrestleMania one, then starting with the uh, Hulk on that program. Oh my God, you know, half three quarters of a house, 
after sellout after sellout after sellout coming off of that extravaganza with uh, uh, Lou Barachi and everybody, you know, everybody in their house and their brother showing up, you know, and coming up even with the great Hulk Hogan coming into a, a less than the spectacular Madison Square Garden. But we built it, you know, to the end and we built it back up. But, you know, all the champions and anybody, anybody across the ring is going to make your money, uh, you know, <laughs> is, a, is a favorite. Jimmy Snuka was, you know, uh, one of my all time. And the different, you know, all the different territories. And the, the reading about that Steve Kern was a was a possible uh, was a possible replacement for uh, Bob had Bob not not succeeded, and I'd have to qualify that 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 statement if it was if that was pre going to Japan with Freddie Blassie or post going to Japan with Freddie Blassie, because. After Blassie went to Japan with those guys, and they were on, he was on the tour. But Blassie was a big, big. He was one of the first cards in in Japan. But I I heard, uh, well, from Blassie because Blassie would come out. He dad no good. It, well, you know, you know, you know. And Vince Jr. loved Blassie. He loved Blassie and he loved Jerry Graham Jr. So after, so, so maybe that before, before the trip, <laughs> Steve was. Steve was considered as a replacement for for Bob if there wasn't, but if it was after a post Japan trip, I'm sure he was off. But anytime, anytime Fred would talk about him, it was in glowing terms, but all negative. You know, man, so I was surprised. I was home watching, and he came on the TV as um, the alligator guy, Gator Skinner. And I was, yeah. I was curious that he was up there because I knew how Blassie used to slam him. And just you know, just bury him. You know, Vince. Uh, Vince and Vince would spend money. You know, send camera crews and guys to film you and everything else just to bring you up to New York and and sink your boat. <laughs> you know, it's, they, they were you know, most would do that. They they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't hesitate. You know, to uh, to spend you know thousands of dollars. Eddie Graham, going back to Eddie Graham, Eddie Graham used to run a series of bookers through his, uh, through the office on 106 North Albany. He would, he had Johnny Valentine, failure. Buddy Rogers, failure. Every, all the guys, until it was Dusty or somebody else, all the guys all, all of his era that came in to run, uh, to run the territory as a booker and programming and feed their ideas. Eddie'd give him enough rope to hang themselves and to show that he was, he would come out smelling like a rose. He would come out and he'd bring the territory back and, and uh, what he was letting go, you know, he'd send Dusty out for a while. And then when he had a good, good heel crew, he'd bring Dusty back in and then they go and, you know, the other booker would be standing there with egg on his face. You, you, you'll, you'll have to explain to me. So, why did Freddie Blassie really hate Steve Kern then? What What was the friction between those? Those two? guys ribbed the hell out of him. <laughs> they ribbed. Uh, they took uh, shit <laughs> and they put it on the bottom of his uh, his doorknob, his door. The you know, to open the hotel door. When you open it on the knob, you get your hand. Well, shit, and and, and everything else, you know, uh, cutting is you know. I mean, it was all, they went full bulldog on him, you know, full British bulldog. Uh, you know, and uh, Fred Blassie was an old guy. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't what he wasn't used to being ribbed. And he was, you know, he was real. You know, he was he was a he was a god in Japan, and he was spoiled, and he was everything else. And these guys, you know, from what I hear, I wasn't on the tour. But from what I hear, they were merciless. And you know, Blassie went on. Got set up. He's got me. The bossy could go off, and they're okay. So they they quieted down, but they they pranked him, and you know the crap on the doorknob and stuff like that. And not not you know just not funny stuff, nasty stuff too. There are different things I'd heard, but was it just yeah. because he was a bit full of himself? Was it was it the usual bring him down? I, I guess I, I wasn't like I said. Well, I wasn't on the tour. I just. Heard what Bla, you know, the things that, that Freddie called them, and and uh, what 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 Freddie thought of them, and uh, 
Yeah, so I would have to remember whether it was post, pre or post uh, Japan that well, uh, he was considered. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, we're talking ribs and we're going to start ending every show like we did last week. We're going to end every show on a Mr. Fuji story of the week. And what have you got this time, Dom? Oh, God. I sometimes have to think, but I was thinking the other. Um, Waikiki was was a barren area. It was Now it's now it looks like uh, Tokyo or Osaka. That is, there's lights and, and it's just it's just a brilliant uh, a brilliant scene now, but Waikiki was a quiet and way down where Jim's Dean's gym was, was a, was a real quiet area. And somebody had left a, a boat with a boat motor with the engine laying around and had been there for a couple weeks and hadn't moved. And, and they didn't know what was going on. And Fuji's friend had boats, had a boat and could have, could have used a, could have used an engine, an extra, extra boat motor. So Dean Higuchi, Dean Ho, they're, they're, they're figuring, they goes, well, I'll go. And he was there. He, he, Dean was a good mechanic. So I'll go, I'll, 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 uh, I'll take the, I'll take the motor off. You guys drive around, pick it up and we'll, you know, we'll get out of here. Fuji, you stand guard. If anybody comes by whistle. <laughs> so there's Dean working, stealing the motor, click, click with the wrenches and the pliers. And hey, people come walking by. And, you know, Dean, he's a big Japanese guy. He's 245 pound, you know, Oriental, you know, with a pumped up, you know, ultimate warrior in the in the 60s. You know, he's a huge, huge guy. Not not that tall, but big man. And people are walking by and Dean's, huh? And he was always polite. How you doing? You know, and, just, uh, and there's Dean uncorking the uncorking the motors. They came back and said, Fuj, I thought you were going to work. I thought you were going to, what's happened? There's people walking by. Cops could have come with you. I could have got arrested. I thought you were going to whistle. So he goes, Fuj goes, I don't know how to whistle. <laughs> the Dean just flipped out. Yeah. But that was, that was the old, that was old Dean's gym back in those days. Oh, I'm going to admit you actually told that story on the first one, but I, I loved it so much that I want to hear it again. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I gotta, I gotta think Fuji with his ribs. I gotta, I gotta keep track of him. So I don't, <laughs> you told I don't me, you told me that one as well. He said, he said, um, oh, who did he get? He got twice. Was I don't know, it's like uh, uh, Professor Tanaka or someone, and um, he got, he got him with the exact same rib that he got him like two years before, and he like put like a lock on his cowboy boots or something. Oh, Sato, yeah, Saito. Saito, yeah. Saito, you were coming out of Providence. He's mad as hell. I go, mad. Why, why, what's, why are you picking on me? What are you mad at me? Ah, I know, I know you, folks. I remember you do that to me in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 I can't, I got to remember. I got to keep track. I cross double my ribs. <laughs> Oh, dear, we're going to have to make that weekly thing. Even if you told the same ones every week, I'd, I'd be pleased to punch with them. They always seem to be like a bit more every single time you tell them as well, so I love them. Absolutely yeah. love them. Everybody, everybody's dead now, so you can, you can enhance them. Mm. You can enhance <laughs> Apart from the uh, lady whose barn burnt down, and she's still alive, amazingly. No, that was, that was Curtis's. Yeah, yeah, Curtis's ex-wife. That was Curtis's uh, house. That was hysterical. It did, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't an arsonist. And that was like the, the Peter Sellers, the Peter Sellers movie with their clothes smoking. And, oh, man. Almost blew themselves up. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, uh, I'll tell you what, you can't really, you can't beat burning down. Was it a house or a barn? Because I wrote down a barn. The farm, it was a, it was a ranch, ranch house. Oh, it was a ranch. A ranch house, yeah. It was Curtis had a, he had a ranch up in, it was, it was his, his cowboy period. <laughs> Curtis, uh, Curtis thought he was a cowboy. He had the ranch up there with the horses and, and everything else, and uh, up on the side of the mountain, up in Makawao, Maui. And uh, his wife from Australia and his other his new, new wife were coming in, and she was trying to get the. Uh, so he put a little of that uh, Kanaka lightning <laughs> to the house. <laughs> And there's a photo of you on the horse that Jim Barnett wanted as well. I'm learning. I'm learning oh, yeah. so much. I'm learning so much these last. Yeah, few weeks. that was that was that's a humiliation <laughs> special for me. Uh, My boy, I can't do the word. Yeah. <laughs> 
Right, okay, then I'll uh, I'll shut down this podcast. That was the Bob Backland episode. If you liked that, follow us on Twitter, Don Morocco Pod, and on YouTube, unless you're watching this on YouTube, uh, Don Morocco's Magnificent Podcast, so you can see all the clips from the show, all in video, as well as the full show as well at the end of the week. But for now, thank you very much for joining us. And I don't know who's going to be on next week. Did we agree Iron Sheik? Could be, yeah. I, 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 Iron Sheik and... Uh... Well, um, uh, Mickey Mick Foley was on last night as well. Iron Sheik's always Iron Sheik is easy an easy one. Well, then we'll go yeah, for Iron Sheik then, because like an hour's worth of easy stories that'll sue me down to the ground. But I'll oh, tell you easy. what. Then. For now, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll catch you next week. Thank you. I very can't much. believe it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs>